So we'll continue our discussion of uh, nonlinear analysis, of which uh, you know we'll only be able to give you a flavor of the kind of approach that we take to analyzing nonlinear systems with respect to their stability and dynamic characteristics. So we were saying that you know in this what we do is all our discussions will be on the phase plane, which is the plot of the phase variables, conversion and temperature in our case, one against the other, all right? So time will be a parameter on whatever curve we draw there, right? So this dx by dt, which is the rate at which conversion changes with time, that we call as pxt, a function of conversion and temperature, and this is minus x plus tau by c10 multiplied by r of x and t, that is one function. The other function that we need is the energy balance equation, which we call as function q of x and t, and this is 1 plus beta tj star minus t plus j into tau into r of x and t, right? So with some analysis to really understand the shape of these curves, we were able to draw these curves in the earlier class. The p equal to 0 is a curve that kind of mimics the shape of the FGS curve that we have already seen. This is p equal to 0. Okay, this divides the phase plane into a, a region above and a region below, and the region above has uh, the what sign it has. We can understand by looking at any point on this curve where the rate is zero because conversion is hundred percent, and therefore it will be minus, right? So p is less than zero or negative everywhere above this curve, and p is correspondingly greater than 0 everywhere below this curve, right? Now when it comes to the other curve, q x of t, we said that it has the following characteristics. It has as many intersections on this curve as there are steady states, right? And then it has to intersect when uh, conversion is 1, rate is 0, and therefore t will be equal to t j star if q is 0. Right, so that is an intersection, and then uh, the uh, I mean, if you put q equal to zero, it becomes clear that this curve cannot go on the other side of uh, Tj star, so it will proceed in this direction. And let us take the case of a single steady state, in which case you will get a curve like this, and this intersection has to be finite because you know the rate has to be finite at zero conversion, right. So, in other words, it doesn't asymptote to the zero axis, it will cut it at some finite value, right? Now, in between what it does depends on how many steady states there are, okay? And of course, you can also look at the, you know, dx by dt, the signs of that, right? This we have already seen because this is, this is what something into dr dt at the dr by dt divided by 1 minus something into dr by dx, right? So this we have derived earlier. So you can look at the signage of this slope from that expression as well, right? But anyway, so the sum and substance of the story is that it will have this kind of a shape if there is only one steady state, of course, it doesn't have to be like this, it can be, it can be like that also, right? In which case the slope will go through a minimum and a, a positive part and then a maximum and negative part again, right? So all this is possible, but I am taking, a, uh, in order to illustrate what happens in this case, we are taking a, a simple looking kind of curve here. 
all right so this curve divides the plane into a, a region to the left and a region to the right okay so even if it is if it has some weird shape like like this you can always stretch it and then recognize the region to the left and then to the right in other words as you proceed along this curve in this direction there is a region that you see to the left and there is a region that you see to the right okay those are the two regions where the sign of q is either negative or positive right so here uh, we see that on this on this curve uh, on this line where conversion is 100 percent if you take any region or not necessarily on conversion equal to one if you take any region to the right of to the left of this t equal to tj star right t is less than tj star so this term is positive rate is positive so this is completely positive right so q is greater than zero okay so now you can see that these two curves divide the plane into four regions we can call them one two three and four and we can see we can mark the signage of the two derivatives in the following manner if you if you take region one it is above the p equal to zero curve so p is less than zero and q is greater than zero okay so you can say q is greater than zero okay if you take region two it is below the black curve so p is greater than zero and it, if it is it is on the same side as uh, of the red curve as region one so q is greater than zero and if you take region three it's again below p so p is greater than zero but it is on the other side of the red curve so q is less than zero and so on so region 4 will be p greater p less p less than zero and q is also less than zero okay so now the idea is to follow what is called as the method of isoc lines isoc lines are short vectorial segments which they depict the sign of i mean depict the variation in the dx by dt that is the slope of the reaction path in any of these regions okay so for example if we take any point here okay so that is in uh, region 2 right so p is greater than 0 which means that dx by dt is greater than 0 conversion is going to increase and temperature is also going to increase okay so dx by dt is going to be positive right so you can write a small line segment with a positive slope of course whether the slope is this way this or this etc the actual magnitude is a matter of calculation but qualitatively it is going to move in that direction right and it is still in the same region so it continues to move in that direction so these short vectors that we are drawing are isoclines and these are for small times small time steps right by and by it will reach this point at which q is zero because it's on the red curve and p is greater than zero in both of these regions okay so in other words temperature is not going to increase temperature derivative is zero and the conversion derivative is positive right so it is going to intersect this curve in that manner right so that brings it into region 3 where conversion 
will increase and temperature will decrease. Right? So conversion will increase, temperature will decrease means it will go in this direction. Okay? And by and by it will we arrive on this curve. I mean we may collapse into the steady state right here. Right? Or we may, depending on the magnitudes of the derivatives, we may cut this. And on this conversion does not increase, it is constant, but temperature will fall. Okay, Q less than 0. So we will hit it like this. Right? And then that brings us into region 4 where both conversion and temperature are going to decrease. So it is going to be a downward slope and so on. All right. So you can see the flow of solution and depending on the magnitude it will, you know, if you are starting here it may directly go there or it may do this and then come here or it may go, uh, do a cycle and then come here. Several possibilities are there. But the bottom line is that it is going to go into that steady state, right? It has to do that because that is the only steady state available to the system, right? There is no option but to do this, all right? So this is the way we can analyze how the solutions are going to vary in time, right? Depending on the set of parameters that you fix. Once you fix your beta and tau and j and all of that, then you can actually numerically calculate these short line segments and plot the flow, right? Now, so this will give you what to expect when you solve these. You can use a nonlinear solver and of course solve these two equations, two coupled equations. But what to expect when you do that is clear from these kinds of qualitative analysis, right? Now you may ask, uh, since there is only one steady state, why should we do all this? Because we know that that steady state is going to be stable and therefore the system will end up there. So is there any use of this? Okay. Now the point is that when you are starting up or when there is a large disturbance, we are talking about large disturbances here, right? When there is a large disturbance, the system will of course return to the steady state. But it may, of, may be of interest as to how it does that. Okay. So that is what I have shown here. This is a study from the literature from a paper by Bilou and Amundsen, which is also, these figures are, are also available in ARIS, right? So in this, of course, the P equal to 0, Q equal to 0 curves are not shown. Only the steady state is shown, which is, which is this thing here, which is the confluence of all these points there, right? Now, supposing you start the reactor, and that is at what about some 300 and 32 degrees or something like that, right? Supposing you start the reactor with fresh feed, no conversion, but the temperature very close to the steady state temperature. Supposing you start here, okay? You see that while the system will get there, it will get there after a long overshoot, large overshoot, okay? So it is going there at which it is 345 degrees or something like that. You want to operate at 330 something degrees, so there is a 15 degree overshoot, right? Which may or may not be acceptable, right? Supposing you start somewhere here, it is even more, right? So it may be dangerous for the reactor to sustain this long overshoots, large overshoots, right? Therefore, it is useful to know this, okay? For example, if you are starting at 350, you are going right out of the board, right? So, um, you know, the nonlinear characteristics are important to understand for fixing the startup conditions, okay? So, therefore, you will choose something like 320 something degrees, something here, so that, you know, your overshoots are not, not large, okay? This is the first part, and maybe we'll take a short question at this stage. Okay, I need to give you the link. I will tell you the question. It is a multiple choice and uh, more than one choice 
could be correct. So you are you are expected to mark all correct answers, not just one. Yeah. So this is the question. Let me. This refers to the linear stability analysis. So the question is this: the slope criterion, which is which says that the slope of the heat removal line on the FR versus T diagram must be greater than the slope of the heat generation line for the steady state to be locally stable, right? So we have seen that this alone does not guarantee local stability, right? Why does it? Why is that so? Okay, choose everything that is correct. So first choice is that it is necessary but not sufficient, and the second choice is that it is based on a steady state analysis, therefore doesn't uh, answer to the unsteady state behavior. And the third choice is it only addresses disturbances of a special kind and not all disturbances. And fourth is it only applies to small disturbances. So these are the four choices, and I will start accepting. Responses. Okay. Mark all that is correct. Give a minute. Hmm? <laughs> is it possible that uh, A, B, C, D, it's all of them are right? It is possible, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, okay, so we don't get the pie chart here, I guess. So, yeah, we do. Okay, so there is a fairly colorful pie chart there. So. <laughs> So let's look at this. Okay. You got five responses, but there are only four people. Huh? You got five responses, but there are only four people. Some somebody answered twice, probably. I don't know. Yeah, we will suss it out. Yeah. But um, you know, it is necessary but not sufficient. What is it? so? It is correct. Yeah. So. In fact, that is, if it was not the case, then I would not have asked this question, right? Uh, second one is, it's based on a steady state analysis. What do you think? It is not based on a steady state analysis because we are disturbing the take uh, the system from the steady state and looking at what happens in the disturbed state, which is not steady state, right? So it is an unsteady state analysis, but it is a special kind of an unsteady state that we are considering in which C is valid. It only addresses disturbances of a special kind where conversion and temperature are related by the steady state mole balance equation. Right? So it's a kind of a partial steady state, it's not fully steady state. And it only applies to small disturbances. Of course, we are not talking about local stability, so that is not the answer. Okay? So D is not correct. The question itself says local stability, so it is obvious that disturbances are small. Okay, that's not the reason why it is not uh, necessary and not sufficient. Okay, all right. So, so, so it follows um, an unsteady, like we are doing an unsteady state analysis, but the condition that we get between the conversion and temperature is that of the steady state. No, so it, we talk about the stability of a steady state yeah. in all cases. Mm -hmm. But the stability requires that you do an unsteady state analysis. Okay, so it's the analysis has to be unsteady state because otherwise there is no question of steady, uh, stability, right? Stability the question arises only when you kick the system out of the steady state mm -hmm. and then ask whether it is coming back to that steady state. But the condition that we are using between X and T is uh -huh. that of. Uh, uh, that that so uh, that is partial study. That is uh, for steady state. Both of these equations have to be zero. Okay, but we are only taking the dx by dx. Dx, the only the uh, first part we are. Okay, so this is as far as the 
single steady state case is concerned, you get a much richer variety of behavior of course when there is multiple steady state possible. So let us consider the situation where you have three steady states, okay. So that will probably look something like this. Okay. Now there are many more regions to worry about, but the signage is still the same. So above p equal to 0, p is going to be negative and below p is going to be positive and to the left of the red curve it is going to be negative, q is going to be negative. And to the right, q is going to be positive. Right is negative. Hmm? Right is negative because if we put r0, then tj is there. And if we oh, sorry, signage is reverse, right? Yeah. So that is same as the previous case, right? But now there are many more regions. You can distinguish regions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Right? And you can make a similar table like this, but what you will see is that region 1, p is less than 0, q is greater than 0, so this is correct. Region 2, p is greater than 0 and q is less than 0, right, and so on, right. So, you can fill this out. So, if you look at this region here, okay, so let us look at region 3 also, it is below the p equal to 0 curve, so p is greater than 0, but it is on the right side of the q q curve, q equal to 0 curve, so this is less than 0, okay. So if you look at any point here, it is going to behave similarly to the previous case because in this region, region 2, p is greater than 0, p is greater than 0 and q is, q is also greater than 0, yeah. right. So it is going to go in this direction, then uh, heat it vertically and all of that. So it will somehow collapse into this steady state, right. If you take some point here, that is region 2, again it will proceed in this direction and proceed here, etc. So this will likely collapse into that steady state, okay. Now there is a bunch of initial conditions here where depending on the thing it may either go here or there, right. But none, no steady state will actually go to that steady state. There is, there is actually only two initial states which will take you to that steady state and th that is maybe some study, some state here and a state here and you can draw the approach from this to this, okay. Now this is a, a very special kind of a, a reaction path and you have to stick to it absolutely, okay. Because the moment you, you know, go even slightly to the left of this, it is going to collapse into this steady state, okay. So and the moment you go slightly to the right of that, it is going to go to that steady state, 
Okay, so in order to actually plot this line is not going to be easy because even numerically, if you start somewhere, there are always going to be random errors, right? There are there is always going to be round off errors and things like that, which will get the steady state going either one way or the other and not land up here. Okay, so there are special methods needed to actually trace these paths, and this path is called as the separate tricks. Okay. It's not it's not a vertical line. It is some kind of a curved path, right? Uh, but uh, and any point on this will technically go there, provided you are proceeding exactly on that path. Even uh, you know a delta disturbance on either side will take it away from this path and take it either here or there. Okay, so uh, you know this cannot be plotted by conventional numerical analysis because the moment there is some round of error which is positive or negative, you leave the path and then go uh, on either side. So this is because of the unstable nature of that steady state. Okay, we made the analogy with a ball being perched on top of the of a hill like that. Okay, so a slight disturbance will go it uh, will send it in either direction, right? So, and now you can also ask the question of what happens if I somehow I am sitting on that steady state and there is a momentary disturbance, okay. So then it will, you will see that it will either go in that direction or in that direction. That path can also be plotted, okay. So this shows that this is a unstable steady state because you cannot, an open loop system cannot function there, right. So now, Therefore, depending on what steady state you want, you have to be careful in choosing your initial state. Supposing you want that steady state because it is a high conversion steady state, you can't start anywhere. Okay, only if you start here, on this side of the separate tricks, will you get there? Okay, and this can be quite uh, counterintuitive, and that is shown in another analysis from a literature paper. This is my, uh, you know, the notes are there for you to look at. So this is again a study taken from the literature from the same paper, also available in Iris. So A, B, C are the three steady states. Again, P and Q curves are not shown, but you will see that all these steady states are leading to A, and all these steady states are leading to C. Okay, this is of course a concocted example. But what it shows is that, and this red line is a separate tricks, right? Notice that this separate tricks is passing fairly close to the desired steady state C, okay? The other business that we talked about in the case of a single steady state is still valid because if you start even at some condition that is fairly close to the temperature of the desired steady state, but at zero conversion, right? Fresh feed you are admitting, and therefore initially you will get fresh feed out. And then gradually the conversion will increase, but the temperature will go, you know, we are off the steady state temperature and ultimately return to the desired steady state. So that is something to be avoided, we have already seen, okay. But even if supposing another, another way of starting the reactor might be to run it as a batch reactor, the CSTR will be run as a batch reactor. So you just fill it, the, uh, fill it with feed, you want something like 90% conversion. So let it convert fully, 100% conversion, and then you start the flow. Okay, so the initial conversion that will come out is 100% and then gradually it should settle down to the desired steady state is what you would expect. So that is a state that is like E that is plotted over there, okay. Because it is on the wrong side of the separate tricks, although the conversion and temperature are both close to what you want, it will not go to C, okay. It will go all the way down and settle down at A which may be some 2 or 3% conversion. Right, so these kinds of weird behavior are in principle possible. Therefore, it you know you cannot simply argue from intuition that uh, you know I want 95% conversion. So let me start with 100% conversion and start at a temperature that is close to my desired temperature, and the reactor has to go there. The reactor doesn't have to. Okay, it has a mind of its own, so it will do something else. Right. So to to chart out this map. 
uh, on the phase diagram is very helpful in deciding what kind of steady states are uh, will give you the desired steady state desire what kind of initial states will give you the desired steady state and what kind of initial states will not give you the steady state okay Version of 1 and then go to below, below like 1, like point 9. No, so you are running a CSTR, CSTR is never going to give you 100% conversion, right? So you have designed a CSTR for whatever reason, right? Uh, if it was a batch reactor, of course, you can operate at 100% conversion, right? The CSTR for 100% conversion will require, you know, a reactor the size of Pawai or something, right? Therefore, see a CSTR of finite volume is going to give you some steady state that is less than 100% conversion and that is what you have designed it for. So, all I am just asking is that in what scenario would someone go from point E in that graph? Yeah, I mean because you want to, you want to start with a, in order to avoid all this kind of business, you may think that let me start as close to the steady state as possible. Okay, one thing is to start with an empty reactor and start flowing the feed from time zero, in which case the initial thing that comes out is zero conversion. Yeah. Okay, so that is your starting on the on some point here. Yeah. Supposing you start with that here, okay, then it will go to the desired conversion, but when desired steady state, but after a, a large overshoot, okay. So Supposing you are not happy with this, I want 95% conversion and who knows, uh, you know, starting with 0% conversion, whether I will get there or settle down at 2% conversion, right? So, because, you know, there is a conversion that is very close to this initial state, right? But because of the way it is situated, it will not go there, but it will go to the higher steady state. So, these are the counterintuitive aspects of the nonlinear behavior, right? Sorry? You said that uh, we don't want overshoot, so we will not operate on these temperatures. So yeah, you, you will have to choose some some initial state somewhere here, okay, where you will you will react it in batch mode up to some some conversion and then start the flow. Okay. Fill the reactor, let it react. When the conversion is 50% or something, you start the flow. And then maybe if you plot the solution, it will. And overshoot is less at that point. Hmm? At that point, overshoot is less as compared to below. Overshoot will be there, but it is it is not not very large. That's all. Okay. If you know these paths, then you can interpolate. So can't we control the overshoot by like what we've learned in the previous classes by controlling the temperature around it? Huh? And figure out how much heat we want to extract. Like not purely isothermal, huh. but extracting a certain amount of heat so that that temperature over Yeah, so that's right. So that is part of design. So for example, if you decide that you want to start with this temperature, it means that you have to have a certain heat transfer apparatus in place that can give you that temperature, right? In terms of heat transfer coefficient, coolant temperature and heat transfer area. Is there some way where we can start at a higher temperature and then control the overshoot? Right? Huh. So that's a matter of... How would we figure out that? Or to what extent, to how much overshoot can we afford? Huh. How, much afford uh, how much overshoot can we afford is a matter of, you know, what kind of substances you have, what kind of gaskets you have, mm -hmm. what temperature they can take, and whether something will evaporate from the reaction mixture at a certain temperature. There are low boilers and all that. So those kinds of considerations will tell you I can maximum tolerate a over temperature overshoot of 15 degrees or something like that. Okay, and then these curves will tell you if I want a temperature overshoot to be less than that amount, where should I be in the you know if I start somewhere there, the reaction path is going to be interpolated between these two. So these two these curves will tell you where you should start so that you will have a temperature overshoot less than what is tolerable okay and then to achieve that so if you want to start this remember that all these curves are functions of your parameters tj star and uh, you know beta and uh, tau all right 
So you will have to have the appropriate parameters because all these curves are functions of those parameters. Sir, so what will be then the minimum condition for having a lace overshoot? Hmm? What will be the minimum condition for having the lace overshoot? What will be the minimum condition? There is no minimum condition. It depends. It varies from system to system. For any given system, you plot this phase diagram, phase map of your how your system characteristics lie. And on that basis, you decide. So it will be different for different reactions. Yeah, yeah, D different from different reactions. For the same reaction, also it depends on the parameters, right? It's because all the, these curves are functions of those parameters, right? A to C. I know that A is another steady state. Huh. Like because the least overshoot is there, so it okay. Seems to be so right. yeah, if you want to go from A to C, if you are operating there. Supposing a disturbance takes you on the other side of the red curve, in whatever manner, this way, that way, right? Once you land here, then you are going to end up there. Yeah. If you are operating in a batch mode, then it is not going to be following these lines, right? For operating what? You said that we can operate in a batch mode to get to any intermediate point in the uh -huh. so that so, so that part is outside this. So that is the, just fixing the initial condition. Supposing I can react it in some other vessel and then pour that mixture into my reactor of interest. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. in that case, we won't be following. No, the that that the batch thing is not uh, this. This is uh, after you start the reactor. Yeah. After you start the flow, and the volume is constant, and then of course you're you're still not the in the steady state. And how are you going to get to that steady state? Which study state are you get, going to get to? And those are the issues, right? So I've got your midsem papers. Yeah. How bad were they? Generally, I mean, it was worse than I had expected, but uh, <laughs> so we will uh, stop this here and. Uh, the current uh, problem set, which is due next week, has uh, requires you to do some of these calculations. You, you may have attempt this, and uh, let me know if it will help to have a tutorial. Then we can have one of the. Sometime on Friday. Oh. So the next topic, and maybe we can take another short question before that. This again has to do with the parameters, but let me just set up the question. Yeah, okay, it's ready to accept responses. So the question is, yeah, in stability analysis, we have introduced these parameters, which have to do with uh, two of them contain the derivatives of the rate with respect to temperature and conversion. And these are the definitions of the parameters. The third contains the heat transfer parameter. So what can we say in general about the signage and magnitude of these parameters? That's the question. Okay, choose all correct answers. So the first choice is all of them are positive always. The second one is M is greater than or equal to 1 and N is positive but L is po negative and so on. So there are four choices. So you can, you can choose all that are correct. Again, one minute. Okay, this time we have got four responses. Okay. So, I think I raised the first question, it doesn't matter. So, what is the, all of them are positive. The first one is correct because 
dr by dt at constant conversion is always going to be positive so n is positive and dr by dx at constant temperature is always going to be negative so 1 plus something so l is also going to be positive and um, um, so the first choice is correct second choice is m greater than or equal to 1 is correct because beta cannot be negative it is a heat transfer parameter n is positive and l is negative so b is not correct okay then c is correct n and l are positive and m is greater than 1 and the d says n can be positive or negative and l can be positive or negative that is not possible they are, they are both positive definite therefore a and c are the correct answers right okay all right so we will get on to the next topic in our course and that is the theory of residence time distributions right so now you already have studied this right you have had some introduction to residence time distribution theory and all that right so why do we need to worry about this supposing i have some vessel okay so why do we need to worry about how residence times are distributed in this kind of a vessel because will accordingly design the volume yeah but uh, now we have already been we have been designing reactors for two courses now right so what's wrong with that that is an ideal case okay so that's an ideal case and what is ideal about it? The state of mixing is what is ideal. Okay. And why did we have to make that idealization? Because otherwise we have the problem of averaging the mole balance and energy balance across the entire reactor for which we will need information about how the rate is varying in different parts of the reactor. And because the rate is a function of conversion and concentration and temperature, we will need the complete map of concentration variation in the re inside the reactor and temperature variation inside the reactor right now in order to get that one way is of course to do the detailed fluid mechanics simulation of this with the reaction term put in the nonlinear reaction term put in and that is of course possible with several approximations for a homogeneous reactor okay you still have to you know if some of you here you know, have worked on fluent and uh, all that you will know that you will have to make some assumption about the turbulence parameters, the k epsilon model you will choose uh, or some other turbulence theory you will have to choose. And so there are lots of assumptions involved in that and even with those assumptions, some the moment you have heterogeneous reactions and all that, it becomes too difficult to solve those equations. Add to that, that the, the fact that the geometry is not very straightforward, okay, it is not like a Cylinder, cylinder or a sphere or a cube okay it is a reactor which is probably cylindrical but which has some kind of a shape for the bottom and top and it has baffles it has a stirrer in the middle it has probably a cooling coil and all of that okay so that is going to be somewhat of a tough task so we wanted to avoid all that so we said that let us assume that the situation is simple enough that our integration over the uh, reactor volume becomes easy okay and we can do that under two circumstances one in which the reactor contents are completely mixed perfectly mixed therefore you have the same conversion and temperature and therefore the same rate at every point within the reactor and that rate is that conversion and temperature is what you see in the flow that is coming out that is one possibility the second possibility is to do the opposite that is every point as long as it is you are considering a different cross section has different conversion and temperature only the conversion and temperature across any cross section is the same in a tubular kind of a reactor and that gives us the plug flow ideal okay but then the problem is that uh, so the real reactor is not obliged to be either perfectly mixed or in plug flow it does its own thing therefore the best you can say with these ideas is that the conversion is somewhere in between what you calculate for a CSTR and what you cal calculate for a plug flow reactor okay now those limits can be fairly wide for example if you take a first order reaction okay CSTR 
conversion is this right where k tau is the uh, damp color number and the plug flow reactor is 1 minus e to the power minus k tau right now if you take for example you let us assume that you are looking shooting for a high conversion so your damp color number k tau is going to be more than 1 so if you take k tau equal to 2 this gives you 2 by 3 this is 0.67 right and that is e to the power 1 minus e to the power minus 2 is what 0.85 or something I think from memory just just check that Point? 0 0.72. Okay. So you can check that number, but uh, so suppose you want, so this is probably not too bad 67% and 72%. Sorry, sir, I double checked. It's 0 0.86. Huh? You're right. 0 0.86. 885. Yeah. 86 okay so so this is pretty bad right so 67 percent and 86 percent so if your boss asks you to the question of you know I have this reactor what is the conversion it will give you and if you tell him it is somewhere between 67 percent and 86 percent he's not going to be very happy about it right so and the situation will get worse if you take kt equal to 3 because this is 0.75 and this is going to be somewhere you know you can calculate that so so in general you know the bounds you are able to estimate for the conversion in any real reactor is going to be quite quite wide and we want to be able to do something better than this so this is the reason why we would like to do something better than CSTR and PFR at least for having I mean for a vessel that is in front of you okay you have designed a reactor assuming that it is perfectly mixed you run the reactor and it gives you some other conversion right now the reactor is in front of you at least can you do some test and say you know this is the reason why the see the reactor is not behaving like a CSTR okay so that would be the next best thing to doing a proper design and if you have enough information on you know this kind of non-ideal behavior then you can probably design, derive some rules if you design the stirrer in this manner and this is the kind of deviation from the CSTR behavior that you get and so on and so forth right so that is the intention of doing this right so this of course problem was recognized earlier but it was Dankworts in uh, 1950s who came up with the with one way of tackling this so he said that any if you take any element of liquid that is that is coming out of a reactor the amount of conversion is that is primarily a function of how much time it has spent reacting in the vessel okay uh, if it spends less time it will react less it will if it spends more time it will react more etc so can we capture this distribution of how much time different elements of fluid different parts of the fluid have spent in the reactor by the time they get out of the reactor okay so he called it the exit age distribution so so this is what so he called this e of t dt and this is the fraction of leaving fluid that is why the exit age distribution uh, that has spent between t and t plus dt seconds in the vessel okay so then probably we can do something with this function if we know this okay now can we measure this we can measure something that is slightly different okay what we can measure 
So Dankwood suggested this experiment that we, you know, you have this process fluid going at steady state, steady flow conditions. Forget about reaction, we just want to characterize the flow, right? So under steady, steady flow conditions, you inject a bunch of tracer, okay, at this point, at the inlet, okay. Now you know that all these tracer molecules, what is a tracer? It has properties very similar in terms of flow to the flowing fluid. It has the same viscosity, it has the same density, etc. So it is not going, and you, the, the way you inject it is also you take sufficiently, sufficient care so that it doesn't disturb the flow. All right. So everything, the flow, everything is going on as before. The vessel doesn't think anything has changed. Okay. But this tracer has some property which will distinguish it from the process fluid. Maybe it is red color where the process fluid is colorless. Maybe it has some conductivity that is different from the process fluid. So there is some property which you can measure to distinguish the tracer molecules from the process fluid molecules. If you do that, then you can measure what is called as the inlet edge distribution. What is this inlet edge distribution? The bunch of molecules that are entering at one time, how much time are they going to spend by the time they get out of the reactor? Okay, in other words, if you catch some fluid here, it has and measure the amount of tracer content in that, okay, the main amount of red fluid that is the red, let us say. If you do that, then you know that uh, the you know, if you have injected, then you will probably get a curve like this of concentration of the tracer versus time. You know that this, because of it is tracer, it exactly you know when it entered, all right. So it has spent this amount of time, okay. So this is the inlet edge distribution, that is all the molecules are entering at one time and they are spending different times in the reactor. What you need is the exit edge distribution, you are catching the fluid at one point in time and asking when did at different times these, these fellows have entered the reactor, what is the distribution, okay. So there is this subtle difference between inlet edge distribution and exit edge distribution. This is something that can be measured, this is what we want, okay. But obviously at steady state they have to agree, right, because no fraction of residence time cut can accumulate in the reactor, okay. So if you look at the amount of stuff that is in the reactor which is of a certain age, that has to be constant with time which means that as much of it must be coming in as is going out, okay. So these two will become equal under steady flow conditions. So this is a very important requirement in order for you to, huh? sorry? I so, you understood the difference between inlet edge distribution and exit edge distribution. So, here, exit edge distribution is you are taking a sample at one time and asking what parts of the fluid have come in at what time, okay. They have come in at different times, so there is a distribution here. They have come in at different times, they are going out together, okay. So, the idea, Dankwurst's idea is that if you know that, you know how much time different parts of the fluid have spent in the reactor, okay. And you can use that information to calculate how, what is the conversion in each fraction of this fluid. And you can average them to get the conversion in the entire fluid, okay. But what is convenient to measure is you inject at one point in time and they will come out at different times, okay. In the first experiment, what we want is you sample at one time and they have entered at different times. Now they are all entering at one time, they are leaving at different times, okay. This is, this is the time, okay. You are taking concentration as a function of time, right. But they will be equal under steady flow conditions because nothing can accumulate, okay. The fraction of fluid of a certain age has to remain constant with time and therefore you can use this experiment to calculate what you want provided the flow is steady. Okay. So he said, let us set ourselves this limited objective that anyway, when you are talking about these flow vessels, you are interested in the steady state performance, right. So under steady flow conditions, we can do this experiment and calculate uh, and find out this distribution of residence times. And therefore, under steady flow conditions, if you call this as inlet edge distribution, if you call this as 
exit age distribution inlet age distribution equals exit age distribution and therefore we can give a common name to this and he called it the residence time distribution okay so the study flow requirement is therefore something to be kept in mind Hmm? What exactly will be term as unsteady flow? Flow that is varying with time? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, initially when you, when you start the flow, it will take some time for the pressure drop and you know velocity profile and everything to become constant in time. Okay, provided you don't change anything else. You have the same volume and you have the same flow rate coming in, same flow rate going out. Under those circumstances, given time, the system will attain steady state. Right. So under those conditions, if you if you do a you know if you do uh, do a velocity map of the fluid at every point in the uh, reactor, it will be constant in time. But, so that applies for a plug flow reactor, right? Huh? That only applies for a plug flow reactor, right? No, no. Any any vessel of any odd shape can get to a steady state provided these conditions you maintain. You don't change the inlet flow rate. You don't change the outlet flow rate, and you maintain the inlet flow rate as equal to outlet flow rate. Okay. And you mentioned that the amount of time it takes for a reactor to get to this state once you start it up from some arbitrary situation will depend on whether it is plug flow reactor or CSTR or something else. But ultimately given time everything will get to a steady state, all kinds of reactors. Mm. Okay. Mm. And once it's reached the steady state, Huh. By saying that the IAD is equal to the EAD, huh. you are saying that whatever like C in profile we have over here huh. is going to be the same as this, it can't be the same as the C out profile, right? It, it can't be the same as what? Like the concentration at the outlet profile and huh. the concentration at the inlet profile won't be the same because that's what... So, no, what we are saying is the fraction of leaving fluid that has spent between T and T plus DT seconds in the vessel is equal to fraction of entering fluid that will spend between t plus t and t plus dt seconds in the vessel Exactly, yeah. And then after that, we're seeing how much of that spends between T yeah. and T plus DT, and that is the IAD. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, the IAD ka concept, hai, you are injecting everything at one time, and they will come out at different times. Right. Exit age ka ye hai ki, they are coming out at one time, but they entered at different times. Because if this is not valid, then that fraction is going to accumulate in the vessel, right? Which is not allowed in steady state. Hmm? Ah, now the idea is, how should you do this experiment so that you get the required information, right? So you need all the molecules to enter the reactor at one point in time. Which is of course practically impossible because time is a continuous, continuously running, it is not going to stop for you and then say that okay you inject the tracer then I will continue right therefore uh, it's an idealization it's going to be an idealization and the idealization depends on the definition of the uh, delta function there is this function that actually a distribution that uh, was derived by Paul Dirac and uh, it has the following characteristics we call this delta t is 0 everywhere where t is not equal to 0 okay wherever the argument is not 0 the function is 0 okay it is equal it is not equal to 0 it has a definition only at one point on the time scale and uh, at that point its its value is not defined but the integral 
is 1 over the entire time period over any time period that contains the delta function is going to be 1 right. So, if this is the case then supposing we want to inject m grams of the tracer right and let us say the well flow velocity is v right coming in and going out we are talking about liquid flows here and there is no reaction so there is no reason for the velocity to change I mean the flow rate to change then what we need uh, uh, is EFT dt supposing we do this experiment and we collect this concentration as a function of time between t and t plus dt whatever tracer fluid is coming in is going to be vc dt v dt is the volume that comes out and because dt is so small we can assume the concentration to be c right and so this is the this is all the fluid that has spent between t and t plus dt seconds in the vessel this as a fraction of the entire fluid which is the integral of this between 0 and infinity this is going to be our e of t dt right now because of the way we are doing the experiment this v c dt is the total tracer this area under the curve is the total tracer that you have injected which is m grams right so so this of course i can cancel out v and you can say that c divided by integral c dt dt okay that is one way of calculating this otherwise i can say that it is vc divided by this integral is m right now this is of course always valid i mean uh, this is valid provided everything entered at one point in time so the kind of supposing i call this concentration at the inlet as c i as a function of time then we need v c i d t to be equal to m delta t this is for the ideal pulse ok m delta t d t this will have the required required characteristics because when time is not equal to 0 nothing is entering concentration is 0 when time is equal to 0 concentration is non zero that's what this is saying and if you integrate this entire thing v c i d t between 0 and infinity is m delta t d t 0 and infinity so this is m the total amount of tracer injected is m grams and it is injected at one point okay so this is the so the concentration therefore can be mathematically described as m divided by v this is the ideal impulse <coughs> okay so now this delta function has another property which will be useful later on that is that if you take any function and integrate that weighted with a delta function which is defined at some point in t naught dt over any interval let us say minus infinity to plus infinity over any interval that contains this t naught okay this is going to be you just evaluate the function at the point where the delta function is de defined okay so this is this is a property okay so i think we will continue when we meet on friday so what we are going to do next is given that uh, you know we now have we have uh, this is what we need to get and we now we ha have an experimental way of getting it ideally we should put this kind of a concentration function into this and the closer we can approximate this the better our results will be right and uh, 
once we do that, then we know from the concentration curve, we know how to get the E of t information, right? Now, given that we know all this, supposing we do this test on a plug flow reactor, and supposing we do this test on a CSTR, what kind of functions do we expect to get for this E of t, okay? If we know that, then we know that uh, the moment we do this test and we get uh, some kind of a, you know, E of t curve, we can compare it with these two extremes and see whether we are close to CSTR or close to plug flow reactor or not close to either, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the next task. So we will derive the uh, E of t function for ideal reactors and uh, then go on from there. <coughs> okay. uh, sir, I have a doubt. This property that you have written, yeah. um, it will only be some value that is not zero at f of t, not right? Like the no. So. Uh, because, so one way of looking at this is because this is 0 everywhere except at T0. Right. So, so f of t minus T0 at T0, wouldn't it just be F0? No, the f of t will have some value. Okay. At T0, delta T0 is not 0. Okay. So, if you shrink this interval closer and closer to what you want, you know, this is minus infinity to plus infinity, and your T naught is somewhere there. Okay. Now, f of t has some behavior over this entire time range. Okay. Now, you want this integral means you are integrating this from here to here. Everywhere else, it is zero. Like all I'm asking is, why uh. is it f of t minus t naught and not just f of t? Like in the property that you've written. Huh. Why is it f of t minus t not giving that result and not f of t? Uh, it's supposed to be saying f of t delta t minus t naught. Huh? Yeah, it's supposed to be saying f of t. Ah, okay, okay, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's correct, yeah. So delta uh, delta function is defined at t equal to t zero. Yeah, this is correct. 